infrastructure is crumbling and the problems are only getting worse. The pressure to find solutions is hot. Let's talk about why American cities have no water, no electricity, and no money to fix their infrastructure problems. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast, hosted by Chad Smelter. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. My name is Chad Smelter. I am your host. Today's guest is Gregory Sauter, who's the president at WGI Engineering down in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thanks for joining me, Gregory. Chad, a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm looking <laughs> forward to the discussion. Me too, man, because uh, you and I talked previously and you were heading up to Penn State and I was just telling you today, I was like, look at that nice sunny weather out here. I'm stuck in Chicago. It's like 50 degrees. It's freezing. But man, you're making me jealous with that background. So uh, we do get spoiled for sure. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. I can't wait for my kids to be older, like we were talking about. And uh, yeah. I can head down your way someday. But um, but let's talk a little bit about yourself, your experience. Uh, you know, what made you get into infrastructure? The first question I usually ask people. Yeah, it, um, <clears throat> kind of a circuitous journey, but um, starting very early, I started working, uh, you know, probably when I was was 12 or 13. And and one of the areas I got into was construction. My father was actually uh, a construction worker working on on big projects in uh, in New York City. So I always had kind of uh, this exposure to to things like construction. Okay. And uh, and to make a long story short, um, I first went to school for liberal arts. Liberal arts for me did not click. Uh, at a very young age, and uh, I packed up my stuff, moved to Boston, and actually started a construction company, and uh, and learned a lot of really hard lessons along the way. Um, but knew that that I wanted to wanted to leverage that, but wanted to do it in a in a bigger way. So um, while I was doing that, I went back and got my my undergrad in mechanical engineering. And uh, and when I finished that, I, I wanted to go work with the big boys on big stuff, right? Yeah. So I went to work for a uh, a firm in Boston called Stone and Webster, and at the time they had uh, more nuclear power plants. They did we did uh, not only nuclear, all kinds of of uh, power projects and and other things, but they had more nuclear power plants on the boards and under construction than anybody in the world. So I actually started my career in nuclear power. Hmm. Wow. And uh, and that led to a whole series of very interesting things along the way too. I went back and got my master's in environmental engineering, and uh, and I wound up being pulled into some really really interesting fields. So um, the cleanup of the the nuclear weapons complex, for instance, I spent two years out at a place called Rocky Flats in Colorado. Hmm. Um, the the chemical demilitarization program, so the cleanup of the uh, chemical weapons. Uh, complex, uh, large environmental remediation projects. Uh, so it got exposed to unexploded ordnance work. I mean, like, you know, the, uh, the, the nastiest of the nasties uh, for many years, but really, really interesting, you know, large complex programs. Yeah. Um, and then after doing that for 10 years, I, I got recruited to a uh, a firm called AECOM and had an opportunity to to travel the world and be involved in uh, in major infrastructure programs around the world. Uh, so just been been exposed to a lot. And, and sorry, sorry, but going back to your, your original question, why yeah. the draw there? Um, you know, it's it's fundamental. What I always say is it's what we do is all the things that we as a society take for granted, mm. right? We get up in the morning, we turn the light switch on, right? You know, we've got a, a safe house to live in. Uh, the roads that we drive in to work on, our communication system, you know, clean water, sanitation, all of those things are, are things that, you know, the infrastructure community provides. And it's all those things we take for granted. Right. You know, thinking back to on, uh, on the pandemic, you know, we tend to focus a lot on on biotech and, and the medical community all doing really interesting, powerful things. But the the most significant impact to human health in the world to date has been the infrastructure behind it, right? Clean water and sanitation are two of the biggest to create healthy societies. 
so it's it's those things that have always drawn me back into you know infrastructure and and the significance of it and it's really um it's a it's a major part of our economy but it's also the piece that provides that backbone for the economy to work right so just really important yeah it's it's a massive uh, you know economic sustainability is huge it's all based on infrastructure everything we do is based on infrastructure exactly, exactly. what you're saying yeah Exactly. I'll, I'll tell you another piece of it too. One of the things that's that's kept me in this yeah. is we get to do great things for great people, right? With great outcomes for our communities every day. And, and typically the people that are drawn to this actually have a service mentality um, and and are, you know, just, just super smart and eager to do great things. So the people we get an opportunity to work with too is just you know, fantastic. The professionals we have here at, at WGI and Streamline are just, they're, they're second to none. I mean, they're fired up to be here every day and they do, uh, they do great things every day and they have great ideas, right? And, uh, and on, the, on the innovation front, I mean, every day they're coming up with new ways to solve the problems. That's got to be amazing having a team that basically you've brought on to your organization that have the same kind of mindset you do and you all have the same culture. That's, that's got to be fun to just watch everybody grow. Yeah, for sure. In fact, you you hit on a really important word there on the on the culture side, right? So, one of the things that that I spend a lot of time on is is the culture of the business. It's just that, like, we we a lot of times we talk about too that we are going through um, kind of a, a digital transformation. You know, with so much happening in the innovation and technology space, we constantly have to be retooling and thinking about how we do things different. And it's really causing us to uh, take a step back and look at everything we do, both right. internally and how we deliver for clients. And you, that has to be part of your DNA, right? We have to have a, a culture of innovation, a culture of change, um, and a willingness to always be thinking about different ways and better ways to do things. So yeah, that's, that's a big part of it. Yeah. And we have so much opportunity now with all this digital AI stuff that's coming out. I'm sure we're going to get more into it, but yeah. we can really uh, in, inspire our our employees. You know, I always talk about this, get them out and, you know, talk about the infrastructure project they're working on, you know, illustrate it, put them in a video, have these podcast yeah. conversations, stuff like that. Yes. That's always one good way to get them, get them out exposure. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, Chad, we tend to be pretty shy about that. And yeah. And our folks, you're absolutely right. We don't talk about it enough. You know, there, there's so much happening. And again, I think the the significance of it to society, we just, we don't think about that part. We're just thinking about getting the job done, you know, uh, but we do need to talk about it more. And one of the reasons for that too is we need more people coming into the field, mm. you know, and our, our, you know, our kids coming up through middle school and high school and going into college are not you know, so many are not thinking about the opportunities in this space, right? Because it's just never been presented to them. Uh, so we need to do a much better job on that too. Yeah. And and look, if we can start talking about virtual reality, digital twin, and all these other technologies, you're going to start moving them into that mind, if, especially if they see it, right? They see a 3D BIM model or whatever, and they, they, yes. it sparks that curiosity. And I think that's where we're going to need to start advertising and promoting more online, especially social media and things like that. And I'm just curious. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, those, those worlds are starting to blur now too, right? I know, yep. you know, my son's 18 years old and, uh, and he spent a fair amount of time gaming, right? But the, the gaming world now, when we talk about, you know, digital twins and visualization, 3D models, uh, it's, it's not a far leap. Right? right. Because because they have an appreciation for the power of those tools, wanting to be involved and engaged in that learning those. Well, it's it's not a big leap to go and, and do that for the built infrastructure, you know. So, yeah, those worlds are starting to come together. Yeah, it's it's I, I think it's amazing. You know, I look at these avatars now. I was telling my wife we were we were talking and she's like, check out this avatar. And that thing looked looks so identical to like us yeah. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. creepy but it is kind of creepy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like how do you know what's real and what's not you know wow. now, what's going to be the future right yes it's going to yes. be interesting. No. and and so so that's what's going to be interesting too is some of these things we don't we don't have walls around yet we don't understand kind of where the, the you know the borders are 
Um, yeah, so it's going to be the, the future and it is going to be really, really interesting. The other part of it, too, is it's just moving so darn fast. You know, the, the things that we are talking about now. So we just finished at WGI last Friday, a week, a week ago today. Uh, we finished our fourth annual innovation contest and the top 10 teams present to our senior leadership team. So they're basically doing a pitch for their idea to our senior leadership team. And the, the number of ideas um, that were around, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and digital visualizations, uh, almost every one of them had a component in there and, mm. and, and they were all viable ideas. Right. So just a couple of years ago, you know, we weren't seeing that. Maybe we had one, you know, but everybody now is appreciating it. And because the tools are coming into mainstream, you know, people, our, our teams really, really get it. Right. Yeah. And they see the power and the impact that it can have on what we do. It's pretty cool. It is really cool. And it's uh, it's one of those things that I'm excited to see which businesses, you know, adopt to these digital yes. transformations and which ones won't, yes. because it, it's a competitive advantage right now. If you start to you like you're doing right, you're, you're building your yes. culture on top of digital transformation, you're going to compete in a much higher level than someone that's still traditionally stuck in blueprints, for example, paper-based systems, legacy systems. It's yes. going to be a big advantage for businesses like yours. In the future. That is, that is absolutely our goal, Chad. It's uh, and, and it's not easy. Right. And it's one of the things that we talk about with our teams all the time is, you know, sometimes it can be hard because we've got a job to do, right? We've been doing things a certain way for a long time. And as an industry, we've been doing things pretty much the same way for a long time. And it's hard to switch gears because you're really then, you know, to a degree, you know, trying to change the plane as you're flying it. And, uh, and, and that's where the cultural piece comes in, getting us to think about this in a very different way, but it is very hard. We do see it as a really, really important strategic advantage for us. Um, I, I believe too, we've got an advantage with our size because you know we're around, around 700 associates. Mm -hmm. And uh, so large enough to have um, significant capabilities and mass, uh, but small enough you know, to be very agile. Yeah. It's, and yeah, that also gives us, you know, a big advantage. Yeah. That's it. I can't wait to see how this all transpires at WGI. It's going to be really cool to watch. And with your leadership, it's, it's, and your vision already, as I looked in your background, like where you're kind of seeing things in the future, that's going to really help your company grow and, and just embrace that digital transformation that's coming. I appreciate that. We're trying hard. Yeah. So uh, another question, yep. the construction business experience that you had, I want to kind of go back since we were futuristic. Now we're going back a little bit. I want to talk about construction experience. You said you were in a construction business. Yep. What was that like? And I would imagine that was you know several years ago. What was that like for you as, uh, you know, learning the, the construction industry? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was painful. <clears throat> I loved it, right? Because I, I, I love the, I love working with your hands. I love <clears throat> seeing things get done. Yeah. Um, and it can be very satisfying, you know, seeing a project through. Uh, but I was, I was naive, right? So I learned a lot of hard lessons and, uh, and I had to put food on the table. So uh, it was a, a real eye opener on the significance of, of getting things right, getting things right the first time, because I had many projects that did not make any money early on, right? Because I, I didn't have the experience, I didn't have the knowledge, uh, I didn't have the best practices down. And, and back then, you know, there was no such thing as, as Google and YouTube. Right. Uh, so you had to learn the hard way, right? Uh, either by other folks that had been there before and done it, um, or the occasional book. Uh, but but books were always out of date, you know, right. to a degree. So uh, so it was a challenge. I was also I was going to school full time and uh, and running the business full time. So it was a grind. It mm. was an absolute grind. Um, you know, I I look back on it and uh, I you know I, I wouldn't trade it. Uh, but I also wouldn't wish that on anybody else either, you know. Right, right. Would yep. you would you rec would you 
um, not recommend, but would you envision that engineers should probably go through like a construction experience out in the field before they kind of get their, their PE? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say, especially for, for civil engineers yeah. or transportation engineers or, you know, folks in that field. Um, absolutely. I, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I'll give you a little bit of story. Um, the, the first nuclear power plant I went into, <clears throat> I had been seeing plans for months, right? And uh, I was a mechanical engineer, so I was doing a lot around piping at the time. And, uh, and, and to see something on a set of plans is one thing. The first time I did a field walk down at the plant and went into this, uh, this room, which they called a pipe chase, which basically means it's, it's a place where all the pipes run into and then go up to a different part of the plant. And, and, and on a drawing, it's real easy to make a change right and right. and move something add something you walk into one of these pipe chases and and i'm talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pipes of all different sizes coming in being crammed together and and running up to another part of the plant you have a whole different appreciation for what it really means right it's so different than what you see on paper and and to your point um yeah absolutely seeing something on paper and envisioning it and then seeing how something really comes together in the field and how hard it is right you know this this whole notion too of constructability yeah all right we we can do a lot of things that you can get the physics to work out right so you can do the calcs and say yes this will do its job but then it's a whole other thing to ensure that it can be constructed in an efficient manner so yeah. so yeah absolutely yeah, that's a yeah. great, uh, great example and great story. Uh, <laughs> it gives different perspective. That's that's one thing I've heard a lot is like, you know, engineering design specifications, and then it gets off to construction and build. And then everyone's trying to put it together because it didn't make sense when it was written versus what was supposed to be done out in the field. There yeah. wasn't enough room or whatever. Um, yeah. but, uh, that's, that's a lot of what happens. And I feel like that experience in the field would go back into the planning and design phase where you could just implement that knowledge, you know, the intellectual knowledge that you built from out in the field to, to that spec. Yeah. And, and also I think it's just too an appreciation for those folks who are spending every day in the field trying to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. You it's, know. A, it's a grind. <laughs> so anything we can do to make that part easier, it's going to be a more successful project. Yes. Yeah. Especially nowadays with the labor shortages and stuff like that, we deal yeah. with mental health and all these issues. Now we're hearing with construction um, yeah. people. What's what's kind of your insight on some of that stuff you're hearing? Yeah. Um, so there's a well, it's all true, right? So the whole industry, uh, you know, starting with the the engineering side, um, the the client side as well. You know, yeah. here, here's another challenge that our, our clients are also. You know, our municipalities, our state entities and agencies, they're, they're all struggling for good talent. We don't have enough folks coming into the industry <clears throat> at any level. And the construction industry, same thing, that yeah. we do not have enough talent for all the work that needs to be done. Now, we are definitely getting better, right? Um, the ability for us to design better and more efficiently tools that now are bring, being brought to bear to make it uh, more efficient. You know, you go out to a typical site today, the number of, of physical, you know, construction workers that you see on a site is, a, you know, a relatively small percentage of what it used to be. But nevertheless, it's still absolutely critical. You need the folks there. Right. Um, but, but technology is going to have to close that gap because we don't see it changing anytime soon. You know, and if we think about the, the infrastructure that's already in place in the country and and the fact that we're, we're already behind on the maintenance replacement or the new infrastructure that's required because of of growth and or degradation in infrastructure, um, there's already an incredible backlog, not to mention, you know, um, um, here in the state of Florida. Yeah, a thousand people a day are moving to the state, right? So you think about the infrastructure that has to be put in place to support that. So that's the new infrastructure piece. And then you've got all this existing infrastructure. So none of those challenges are going away. So we have to find ways to do it more efficiently and effective because the 
you know, the labor shortage, but also the resource uh, shortage going forward, you know, the dollars to actually do it, inflation's impacting construction in a big way, it's impacting yeah. our business. Um, so those challenges, you know, we're going to have to leverage technology to close that gap. And that's a great segue into Streamline. <laughs> so yeah. I want to I know more about, uh, you know, the stormwater management system you've built. I talked to Alan Dodd in Fort Lauderdale. He, that's how you and I connected. Yes. And he was so impressed by your, your, your technology, it sounds like. So I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. we got like 10 minutes. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so, so Streamline is a wholly owned subsidiary of WGI. We created a ventures organization in WGI to invest in these great technologies. And one of the things that's so cool about about Streamline. Uh, Streamline is a it's a company that was founded by a gentleman by the name of Pete Singhoffen. He's a he's a legend in the stormwater and the water space. Uh, he created this company 40 years ago. OK, and he created some very powerful software that continues to develop and get get better and better over time. Yeah. This latest generation of this software um, it gives us the capability to um, forecast flooding. Okay. And, you know, and I'll use the state of Florida as an example because it's a good one. We are, we're, we're blessed with so much water here, right? Plenty of rain. Yeah. We, got, we, have, we have plenty of rain. We've got, you know, plenty of groundwater and we've got water all around us on the peninsula, right? And uh, yeah. so blessed with that water, but it's, you know, that blessing is also can be a curse. And, um, and if you think about the tools that we've had in our toolbox to deal with that, they've been, they've been very crude instruments, you know, things like, like inundation maps, for instance, to understand how flooding is going to impact it. it it's, uh, it's been a very dull instrument. Mm -hmm. And what's been created by Streamline based upon these models that they have created over the course of 40 years. And the thing I think that's you know, it's really, really powerful about this is it's it's technology that's tested. Uh, it's been tested and proven out over the last 40 years because the base modeling capabilities have been through, you know, um, endless rounds of perfection. And what it gives us the ability to do is understand uh, and forecast flooding down to, you know, a house level. Right. So base elevation of a house, specific locations, specific locations on a road, on a on a building, on an infall or outfall. Um, very at a very, very detailed, granular level. Right. So the significance of that and 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 let me just take a step back to, you know, the reason I'm so I'm so passionate about this. Um, I, I just feel like, you know, with every passing storm. And, and every hurricane that comes through Florida or significant rain event, we see the impacts of it, right? And it, it just, it really, really bothers me that we've got a capability to have a early warning system um, around flooding and, and what it's going to impact, where it's going to impact, and for how long, and and not be able to take action on it, right? Well, now we've got the capabilities to take action. So I just, I, I feel this pressure to get the word out, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the types of things that it gives us the ability to do, you know, we can anticipate road closures. So, you know, mm. what roads do we need to close now to pinpoint evacuations? It, it's one thing to say, you know, to a whole county, for instance, you know, you've got to evacuate. Well, that doesn't make sense if only 5% of the county is really going to get significant flooding. So right. to be able to pinpoint the evacuations. Um, you know, we talk about the impact of flooding on assets. So the, a simple thing like being able to move cars out of harm's way, right? Knowing where the flooding is going to be, alerting that population and say, move your cars out, Right understanding too where we've got opportunities for uh for smart sandbagging right or temporary flood wall deployment right so yeah. you can't do those things everywhere right you can't you know we can't put a, a flood wall around the whole county but what we can do is know those places that are going to be impacted in a given event and take action um also too you know we've got some incredible water infrastructure in the in the state 
um, it gives us the ability then to be proactive, right? Say so to lower lake levels, to start pumping water out of certain locations mm. to prepare for that water that's going to be coming into the region and give it a place to store it. It also lets us be very thoughtful with our uh, emergency responders. So, you know, giving them the information they need to know where they can deploy resources in advance of that flooding and the types of resources they need and, and how long the flooding, you know, what's the duration of the flooding? We've got the ability to know that. So, so these are things that can really change how we think about and respond to flooding. Um, and the real-time flood forecasting system at Streamline gives us the ability to do that. I love this. I love this. This is exactly what a lot of, well, everyone in the country municipality-wise needs uh, to be able to predict where these floods are going to happen. It saves millions and millions of dollars if you can really move people out of the way and save lives too. These are lives, huge sure. impacts Yeah, that, that, yeah. that this type of technology could have. What I'd like to know is how are you trending the data and what type of instruments do you use to like predict how this is going to you know flood over time? Because I would assume that you have to have some type of baseline to collect uh, information to understand how the system works or maybe a light rain versus a heavy rain. Do you, yeah. do you trend the data? Like, how's that work? Yeah. Good, good question. So there's a couple different pieces to it and the rainfall data is the first piece of it, right? Right. So understanding the rainfall data, uh, what does the forecast look like? Because again, one of the things that's powerful about the system is the ability to forecast out one, two, three, four, five, six days in advance, mm -hmm. right? That process starts with the rainfall data. Right. And ingesting, you know, you think about some of the things that certainly have changed, give us the, the power to do this, but, um, you know, changing computing power. So the ability to ingest all of this information, rainfall data, um, and, and it's both forecasted and then real, uh, you know, real time rain yeah. data. So that's the, the first piece of it. And every hour that's being updated and put into uh, this incredibly complex model. The second part of it is <clears throat> the the uh, hydraulic engine, right? So right. it's not just the rainfall, but what are the current conditions in the streams and tributaries, in the uh, in the ponds and water catchments? So what's that current condition? What's the water levels? Uh, <clears throat> what's the current uh, groundwater levels? Right. Mm -hmm. What's the moisture in the soils? All of these things are being taken into consideration in the model. So you got the rainfall data, you have this uh, incredibly powerful and complex um, hydraulic model, then that takes all that in. And that's how we know, right, where the water is going to fall, how it's going to act, how much of it is actually going to go into the ground, uh, where it's going to run to, where it's going to start to pond and where it's going to flood. And then, of course, it's one thing to have the information, but it's another to be able to visualize it and understand it, to be able to take action. And the third piece of it is the dashboard mm. gives, gives you very easy to understand information on the flooding, where it's going to be, the uh, the depth of the flooding and the duration of the flooding again. Uh, and, and we have what we call risk points. And we can put these risk points on on any infrastructure, uh, any place within the, the modeling zone. Um, so we can pinpoint it down to specific, you know, house levels, uh, asset levels, et cetera. Uh, and that's the third piece of it. So we can visualize the whole thing as well. And that's impactful because if you're a public works director or a city manager, you can sit there at your desk and start to see the trends and know where to make those decisions faster to save those lives we're talking about and get that emergency personnel moving people out of the way. That's yes. that's huge, especially. Is it real time or is it not? Are we close? Like, how is that working yet? You know, it, as far it, as it is real time. Okay, I, I wow. because we continue to validate it, right? So. Yeah. <clears throat> When we see, I'll give you an example of a hurricane, as, as we see a hurricane forming, right? So there's another part of this too, which is <clears throat> the coastal and having uh, the information from the coastal influence as well, which is a big piece of it. And that's also part of the model. So I'll give you the example of a hurricane. Um, when a hurricane's formed, it starts moving towards the coast. Um, as soon as we start to get those um, advance warnings and the uh, advance estimates on rainfall, 
that starts going into the model, right? And we're looking at, we have the ability to, to see where the impacts are going to be. And with every passing, you know, hour and day, it gets closer and closer and closer till you are, you have a very good understanding of what's going to happen. And then once an event starts too, then you're, you're taking the real time data into consideration. We also have the ability to take, um, you know, uh, stream gauges, for instance, and uh, and real time coastal measurements into the model as well. So it's it's truly real time and validating that the, the results that we're getting are correct. This thing is really intuitive, man. I can't wait to see it someday. You have to show me the dashboard and I, run me through I some. Love to. I, some I, I, it's incredible, and, and that's what I said too. You know, Pete and the team, the streamline team, which are just a, a phenomenal group of folks have created something really special here. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes they feel like it's, it's being hidden under a bushel here. We've got to, we've got to let everybody see that light and, uh, and, and share it with folks that can really use it to make a difference for their communities. Well, I truly appreciate what you've done in the infrastructure world and just making a difference for everyone, but also your company and, and streamline, you know, it sounds like this is going to be a very in, in, intuitive platform where it can make a huge difference for a lot of cities throughout the country and not the world. And uh, thank you for, for joining me on the show and sharing the information. Thanks very much. Pleasure being here. Yeah. And nice how chat. can people, yeah. How can people get a hold of you if they wanted to reach out? Uh, they can go to WGINC.com and That's they can find us there and also be links to uh, the streamline information as well. I'm glad you didn't put your cell phone out there. I've had some guests do that <laughs> times. I'm like, That's not a good idea. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> That's the best way to handle it. Go to the, the website and, and check Streamline out and check w, the WGI out. So um, I appreciate it, man. And thank you for, uh, again, joining me on the show, being a guest and, and sharing your information with the audience. My pleasure. Nice talking, Chad. You, you have a great weekend. We'll talk soon. Do the same. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. We hope that this show brought you some insight on relevant topics within the infrastructure world. Please join us every two weeks on Tuesday for the next episode. If you're interested in being a guest on this podcast, please set up a 15-minute interview with your host at calendly.com slash chadsmeltzer. 